here in about a minute. Well, about now. Okay. Um, thanks. Sorry, don't mean to interrupt. Um, if people did want to go to the career fair, you were just here for the uh, meetings, that's fine. I welcome that, and uh, I recognize that as a priority. Uh, I was over there earlier today. It was uh, looking like uh, a great, great experience for meeting uh, potential uh, uh, potential employers and uh, internship sites. And uh, you know, I, again, I uh, I do view it as a priority for students. Okay, we're once again dealing with some AV uh, you know, flakiness here, so. Um, uh, we'll have to bear with that. Um, uh, but I did have two announcements before we get started. Um, the first is uh, someone had uh, asked here about uh, smoke testing and guidelines for smoke testing. Uh, uh, this book is the best source that I'm aware of um, in that area. It talks about uh, some of the needs for smoke testing, motivations, um, at a number of places uh, in the book and has some sections specifically on smoke testing. So if anyone would like to take a look at it, uh, they're welcome to uh, come up here afterwards and could sign up to, uh, to borrow it. It's generally a, a great book on software testing and it's one of many that I own on that subject and which students can look at in my uh, office. If you do borrow this, I'd ask that you borrow it just for a couple days here because uh, I will be planning out some more material in that area. Would like to have reference uh, to that to that book as well as some others. Okay, so that's uh, topic one. The second topic uh, was that um, uh, I had been asked uh, by a student uh, about um, uh, further information about the pre-op operation testing. Um, there was a video circulated to you folks. In fact, two videos by a um, prominent uh, surgeon and researcher, uh, Dr. Gary Groot. Uh, those are posted to the Moodle site. And one of those videos um, was on uh, pre-operation testing. Um, and uh, I called over uh, to Dr. Groot's office. Um, Dr. Groot is uh, out of the country until uh, the beginning of, of this coming week. Uh, so he will be back in, I believe, Tuesday in his office and would be glad to meet um, you're welcome to contact him at this address. But another member of his team, uh, Farha Akhtar, I spoke to, and, and she's very articulate and um, can answer a bunch of questions as well. So if you were to want to learn more about that and um, you could put together your questions into an email, you could send mail, I would send it to those too, and um, they could get your questions answered. Uh, Farha did no sh note that uh, although uh, Dr. Groot is overseas, uh, she'd be glad to try to do what she can to make sure that you get uh, response, fast responses or anything she can't answer or other members of the team can't answer from him um, very quickly. So if you are considering that, um, that app as a possibility and would like to learn more, this would be the way to do it. Okay. Farha is, is right here on campus, and you could also email her and go talk with her if, if that were a priority. Uh, she seems quite knowledgeable about the, the needs. Okay, so that's the um, uh, pre-operation uh, testing contact. Now, um, I did want to spend uh, most of today's lecture on this continued discussion of best practices. and. Uh, a student just came up while I was preparing here and asked me um, to talk a little bit more about uh, the roles of the build master, and uh, I wanted to weave that into some of today's discussion, um, uh, particularly our discussion of continuous integration. Okay, um, so last time we talked about accountable positions, and I noted the need to have um, points of accountability, points of where the buck stops, sort of the people taking ownership of certain issues, making sure things get done in a number of areas. Most importantly, the project manager, point of contact for the whole project, but also for the dev team, the test team, uh, and having a risk officer that's uh, well-defined. Typically a part-time position, but one that's called for to act uh, at many times during the semester. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, 
I want to go on though today and talk uh, about a set of additional needs. Um, uh, the first was it concerns us risk officer and it has to do with uh, risk management. Um, risk management at a crudest level is about transforming risks from being viewed as sort of lightning strikes that come out of blue and you get roasted or not as, as chance would have it to something which we consciously can head off or make ourselves much less vulnerable to them. Because all too often in life, ladies and gentlemen, we can't dictate what will happen, but we can dictate our vulnerability to what will happen. We can evaluate the possibilities and protect ourselves against many of them. There will always be black swan events or other components that we can't fully anticipate. But for many things in life, there's hints as to warning ahead of time, or you know the territory well enough, you just know certain things are likely. In the course of your projects, there's certain types of problems that are not unusual. People get sick. People are too busy to contribute. People go incommunicado. People drop the class. Tech staff are not available to configure things or to answer questions. Technologies don't play together well. There's interpersonal conflicts between people. There's possibilities that the, the uh, code base as you're approaching a deadline will be too buggy to release as is. Those are just some of the many thing you are behind schedule and implementing features for a, for a deliverable. These are things that are not only in the realm of possibility. I mean, they're almost certainly going to hit by be hit by multiple of those in the course of the semester. And when you're in a situation like that, where the nature of the risks is fairly predictable, you really it really behooves you. It, it will be negligent not to try to prepare at some level, to try to anticipate what might happen and ask, can we make ourselves less vulnerable to it? Can we, can we make ourselves less likely to be damaged by these things or make them less likely to occur? In other cases, we may not know what the risks are, but we can scan for them ahead of time. We can have sort of an eye out, talk with people in the trenches about what's going on, and so, you know, you learn, okay, this technology is a flaky technology. It, it, has, it has points of inconsistency. Or, um, you know, there's this, there's this ongoing issue with tests not really, not really finding the issues. You can kind of get your ear, put your ear to the ground and hear about these things. And particularly if you're a project manager, a lot of your life is going to probably be talking with people on the team. What, you know, tell me about your worries. What's what's going uh, what's going on here that that worries you? What are you concerned about? Um, and you get some lead time. So good risk management can make a night and day difference between it um, for a project. It can make the difference literally between a project that goes from fire, fire, fire to fire to fire to fire, fighting different fires, always in a crisis mode, always just responding reactively to what's going on always just running after what has to be done urgently and never getting time to really invest, or a project that's actually quite smooth sailing and is quite stable. You may think I exaggerate, I know. I've been in both types of teams. And a lot of the difference is risk management. It's staying ahead of things. Um, it's making sure that today's risk doesn't become tomorrow's problem. And it's learning from things because today's problem is tomorrow's risk. So if we can learn from what's going wrong now, we can recognize, okay, that might strike us again. You know, someone goes incommunicado for two weeks. Um, someone's sick, they're a key position that no one's been shadowing. They're the build master and now no one's the build master and the builds are failing regularly. And people start not using the build server. They just start 
doing it on, on the side, instead of sending code to each other in email. You know, um, you, can, you can learn from your problems and view them as risks and then start viewing them as how do we protect ourselves from them and how do we, how do we spot when they're, like, when they're getting more worrisome, okay? So um, comment from Jerry Weinberg is if you do not aggressively attack project risks, project risks will aggressively attack you. So this is a matter of just being mature. You know, lightning just doesn't, like, like a problem with, um, with a technology is not just like an lightning bolt that strikes you out of the blue. It's something you can spot early, you can do a bit more research online about what people's experience has been, do spike prototypes to test out the system, see how reliable it is, see well, how well it plays with other technologies, and you can head off a lot of risks. So really good risk management is what allows, and I, I highlight this, particularly for those who have entrepreneurial interests. Good risk management is what allows a company to undertake higher yield projects. You know, if you go over to the Edwards School of Business, they'll talk with you about a trade-off between risk and return. If you have a higher risk project, you can often have higher return on it. But in order to get that return, you have to shoulder heavier risk. You have to be on the bleeding edge of technology. And the folks who succeed there, it's not merely by chance they, you know, dodge the bullets while others don't. It's they can do better risk management. That's what allows them to dodge, the, that's what allows them to avoid a lot of these risks and do things to the cutting edge which get the first mover advantage, which get the real high, high, high benefits from the market instead of just being a market follower where you're one of dozens and dozens of companies competing in the same space. It allows you to sort of really seize the lead in terms of entrepreneurial uh, opportunities and opportunities more broadly uh, commercially. It allows avoiding many problems. It really makes the difference between a project which could be a pain to work in, where you're just counting down the hours, and where you're you know you're hoping to move on to another position, to a job that's that's actually quite enjoyable. Um, and you know it allows uh, allows uh, resilience to problems. When problems arise, you have greater lead time to deal with them. You have more time to think about them, and you have some known strategy to head them off if possible. Um, allows you to sort of bound the uncertainty about how long it will take to deliver and avoid just um, uh, shifting, uh, shifting risks onto a customer or what have you without realizing it. So this is not a small matter. Um, there's books written in the software industry um, uh, on this topic, many of them. Um, one of them uh, by Tom DeMarco is called Waltzing with Bears. and. Uh, you know, is much about this issue of sort of managing risk effectively. And people have looked at software risks. I mean, software has been famous for projects that are over budget, over time, and don't deliver on schedule. Um, as we'll talk about in software estimation, it's particularly, um, uh, there's a particularly sort of strong um, myth in some areas that, that computer projects are impossible to estimate effectively. The joke was when I was an undergrad, if you have an estimate for how long a project will take, you double it, you shift up to the next highest unit. So if you estimate it's going to take a day, you go to two days, and then you, sh actually I think it may be three times three, and then you shift up to the next highest unit, so say three weeks, and then you add one. Um, so, so, you know, four weeks, um, something like that. I, I don't remember the exact algorithm, but I'm, I, I'm not sure how accurate it was. Um, but the point is, it's way off, like by an order of magnitude often. Um, so here are some of the common risks in, in software. Uh, personnel shortfalls, unrealistic schedules and bullet, uh, bullets, or budgets, right? <laughs> Developing the wrong software functions, so the wrong user interfaces, so poor poor um, addressing of, of user needs in, in functions or interfaces, um, uh, dealing with continuous stream of requirements change that uh, forces um, a project to never quite uh, converge, et cetera. And many of the techniques that 
or practices that we're talking about in this class are meant to address these questions. Like this issue of ongoing requirements change. This, this relates directly to our use of agile approaches. Why do agile approaches help with heading off risk of requirements change? Compared to a waterfall model, suppose you have a choice between delivering a project, um, you work for six months uh, on that project, and provide a deliverable to the user at that point versus uh, having one deliverable every two weeks and you have 12 deliverables. Why does it help to do 12 deliverables rather than one big deliverable at the end of six months? You catch problems early. Catch problems early, I like it. Um, you, you spot incompatibilities between different people's assumptions in different areas of the software early because you try to bring them together early instead of the big bang at the end. What's another issue though? You're reacting to changes, both your requirements and potential new risk as you investigate. That's exactly right. So, so if you're delivering eight to 12 different iterations, you're, if there's technology changes, you're able to track those from one iteration to the other. Um, change course a little bit between iterations instead of putting one egg, you know, all your eggs in one basket for the six months. But more to the point, even importantly, if there are requirements changes from the user, if the user's needs changes, they can simply reprioritize what they want to do for the next iteration. Each deliverable, you get guidance from them. What should I do for the next iteration? What's the high priority feature? If there are requirements change, Okay, next deliverable, they have this as the change requirement. Instead of, you know, you've gone for six months, you know, this way, and then they say after six months, no, I want you over there. And you have to head over there. It's much better to, to kind of go, you know, a short distance and say, okay, where to next? And they, and they repoint you. So you end up doing a lot less work. The same thing is true to some degree with technology changes. You can, you can adapt the technology along the way for figuring out what the, uh, you know, where there are problems early on and, and dealing with them in, in terms of uh, uh, understanding of how different people's contributions will come together, et cetera. So many of the practices we're talking about are meant to, meant to deal with this, uh, deal with, uh, with risks, you know, spotting issues and externally furnished components as another example, unrealistic schedules and budgets. If we're building 12 deliverables along the way, we have a much better sense of how long things are taking and the user may scale back their expectations recognizing it's taking long, but they feel they're getting value along the way. They've got you know, several deliverables in place, and then they realize, okay, this is taking longer, let's only do, let's cut out these features, do these few ones, instead of taking just longer overall. So, what am I looking for, in the end of the day, what am I looking for, from you on risk, um, risk management? Because we'll come back to this issue, in the spiral approach. Well, I want you to do risk identification. What risks are there? I want you to do some sort of exposure analysis. How much do these risks matter? Look, give a sense of, roughly speaking, a probability of this high or low, high, medium, low, say the impact, high, medium, or low. When we say exposure, we're considering chance of happening, impact, if it happens. That considers both, okay? Uh, risk exposure considers probability and severity if it happens. Um, and then, having identified some risks, you gotta be, you know, reasonable, okay, risks that are significant enough to, to think about here. What are the exposures? Which are the ones that are bigger? And I expect you to be able to list those. And then how are we gonna handle them? And I want you to be able to list this. Um, can we just avoid them all together? So suppose we were talking about the Oculus project. You know, there's this team and they have issues with testing. Um, we, if we encounter those, we can handle it in these ways, or we could altogether uh, avoid use of, of um, say, Unity environment and, and use WebVR instead. And so there, there are sometimes choices we have that will head off whole domains of risk. We decide 
you know, that because of some incompatibilities between iOS 11 and iOS 10 and the handling of these things, we're just not going to have an iOS version of this project, just an Android version or what have you. There are times we can avoid risk. In other cases, we accept them. We can say, look, we're willing to deal with this risk. We're conscious of it. We'll be scanning for it to give us lead time, but we accept it. Um, but in a lot of cases, we try to control it. And the two strategies I really want you to think about the most here, these are the take-homes from this slide, um, or from this part of the slide, is you either put into place mitigation plans. You do something up front that will mean the risk has less chance of happening, or if it happens, will have less impact. That's one possibility, mitigation plan. Or you have a contingency plan. Here, you don't invest up front other than planning, but if it happens, you have a plan of what to do. So you don't invest up front. You only invest if it happens and you know exactly what you're gonna do if it happens. So, you know, if someone drops the class, you have a plan who will take their place for different positions. Maybe. And this actually gets into a bit of a mixing of these models, which is fine. I'm not particular about the labels here. Um, you have someone shadow the person. Everyone on the team who's in an official position is shadowed, say. So in other words, someone follows them around and maybe does pair programming with them or, or works alongside them a lot of the time to see their issues. And so if they get sick or if they drop, there's someone else, this is kind of a mitigation strategy, who's there to just take over, because you've invested up front in that sort of training of that person. Contingency plan might just lay out who takes over if someone leaves. And so there's just no confusion. You don't lose a few days trying to figure out who's going to be the new build master. You know who's going to be the build master, because you planned it out already. Okay. Um, so the point is to be mature about the fact that things happen. and and to have in place a plan, either that you invest in upfront or if it happens, what you will do. If you can't reach Merlin, you will try to do X, Y, Z to, to deal with the problem. Um, okay, so um, yeah, contingency planning is something you do if it happens, you have a known plan to do it. Mitigation, the resources are allocated, spent up front. And then you actually, um, uh, by, by so doing, you lower the chance it will happen or you lower the impact, if it does happen, of it going um, the wrong direction. So what I'm looking for is a risk officer. Um, I say risk scanner. What I actually mean here is risk scanning. Okay, I'm looking for you, and it's probably the risk officer's job in most cases, risk scanning. Um, to be looking out for risks as um, they might be uh, coming about or as they show, show signs they might be coming about. This includes new types of risks as well as risks that you've enumerated might be happening. There's a conflict in the team between two different people. So you anticipated the possibility of a conflict and now it's coming about. Or, you know, it's looking likely that this technology is is unstable you found you you were concerned because you couldn't find much online about it and now it's from what you're hearing from the dev team it's it's kind of flaky on um, when they try it out sometime and you've you've got a couple more weeks of lead time because you've heard this and you can start doing planning what if it continues to be bad, okay, we'll go to this date. If we're not confident enough, we'll go over to this technology. And you give yourself the time to research other technologies, right? Um, I look for an updated risk plan. Every deliverable, I want to have a risk plan, okay? What, um, uh, what's, what's, your, uh, what's your enumeration of the top risks? Which of them you assess as sort of uh, the worst? and how are you going to deal with them? There should be a prioritization of the risks. That's the top 10 risks. And at the end of the course, we'll be doing a post-mortem. Uh, we'll be doing a reflection on the project 
on each of the projects to to talk okay what worked what didn't work what could we have done better um, and you should plan on doing that each deliverable I think how could we do better next time this is not a witch hunt it's it's you know how could we improve our game this next time round um, what could we do better how could we enhance communication how could we make it less like people get burnt out it's about uh, trying to learn from what's happened and try to build on it to, uh, to do better next time. Okay, I want to talk about assertions, because assertions are required in the course. You folks have used assertions before. Is that right? 270? 370? Yeah? Okay, so they, I don't think I, I need to talk about these too much. I mean, people talk about this being an example of offensive programming. Not offensive in the sense that it's in your face and you know, um, uh, mutter muttering uh, transgressive words, but but offensive in the sense that it's it's going out there and trying to get a program that has that has errors to to show those errors. It's it's actively it's not passively sitting back and waiting till it crashes. It's trying to find out is there something wrong, and know as soon as possible. And there's various techniques to do it. And, you know, on lower level things, you film, in, like C code, you might fill memory with illegal values. So if you read an illegal value, maybe it's an area of memory that will be used for indices, and you give minus ones there. So, you know, if you use one of those indices, you'll probably trigger a memory error if you use one of those as an indice. Or you set default uh, values for enums to be illegal. and so if you're just using the default value for this, your program will start. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, uh, sort of assertions and, and error handling later. Um, suffice it to say that assertions are designed to catch logic errors and developer mistakes. They are supported by most languages um, as a built-in language feature. Java, yes. Scala, yes. Um, many other languages. Um, they should appear in, um, in debug code. In code that's given to the user, there's active disputes about whether we should leave assertions in there or not. But in dev code, in, in code used for debugging and development, they are to be expected. And I want your code to be littered with assertions. And I want to, I want to make sure you use the assertions to their potential, not in an overly constricted way. I want you to use assertions in a in a sort of broader way that will check things. Um, one obvious place is checking preconditions, postconditions, and invariants. Um, are these terms familiar to you? Preconditions and postconditions? Where did you hear about them? What class talks about those? 270? 270? Somewhere around. Yeah. Okay, did 370 also talk a lot about them? Okay. Um, well, this class will talk a lot about them, and you will put them in place, okay? Because um, it is required. Um, and it's required for a good reason. Thinking through, like, what can this method take in as values for these parameters? Does it? Okay, so here's a reference parameter. It's one that refers to an instance of the class. Can it be null or not? You know, um, it takes in an index. Um, does that index um, have to be a value within a certain range? Um, it takes in a double value. Does it have to be a positive double? Um, uh, so preconditions and then postconditions. What is this function achieving? What's its job? What does it return, for example? What changes does it make to the program state? Um, and these are things you can test directly with assertions. And I think in 270, you did a lot of that. You tested preconditions and postconditions. Yeah. And you should do a lot of that. It documents your assumptions about that code. It documents what you're thinking is the case. And it's very valuable. Um, uh, you can spot logical oversights by, um, by programmers. So by putting in assertions, you can spot the certain property of the data structure. You know, this data structure should never hold duplicate keys, for example. Or all the values in this data structure should be non-null. Or this data structure always has at least one element in it. Um, 
those are properties of the data structure that you can check with an assertion. And at any one time, question? Or is it something that the developers should be doing or that the testers should be developers. doing? Developers. Developers. Because these document developer thinking and they're creating them as they write the code. Now, testers can fruitfully put in assertions into tests that they create. Uh, and generally, they will be doing some of that. But the ones that I want to see most critically are ones that take place in the process of the code. Because, you know, testers, so there's many levels of testing. It's sometimes talked about there's kind of a V of testing. And, um, and basically the deal is that for different levels of code detail, there's kind of corresponding tests that take place. So at the lowest level, there's unit testing. And this is developer responsibility. And we, I expect here tester development. I expect tests to be written and in place before the code is written or at the very least at the time the code is written. So this unit test, that's, that's dev responsibility. And this is where a lot of assertions go. Now, at the level above that, there's integration testing. Um, and integration tests can be written by devs or testers. Further up, there are system tests. And these are typically written by testers. And further up yet, there's acceptance tests, which are basically used um, for uh, uh, used for sort of determining if the requirements are met and so on. These are almost certainly the domain of testers. Now, these upper domains, I mean, testers can use assertions as part of their creation of tests. But really, this unit testing is accompanying um, low-level uh, development. So this is sort of low-level um, uh, development. And here, assertion should be all through this code. Because there's only so much you can test after, um, after a method is finished running. You can, you can test that, OK, its input-output relationship is good, and that's good. But within the code itself, in the middle of the code, there are probably certain properties that, of data structures you want to ensure. There's certain things you want to check. Um, and that within the code itself, you're going to be putting in place assertions to check those things. Those are not things testers are going to reach in and insert code into your, into your code base to do. They're going to be writing code that tests your code base, but it's inside your code itself that there's lots of assertions. And that's what I really want to see. It's while this code is written, there should be assertions in place. And by the way, this, this has to do with sort of low-level design and high-level design. And this is requirements. Um, sort of acceptance, high-level system testing, low-level design integration testing, low-level dev is, is sort of uh, unit testing. So, so I definitely want to see these littered throughout the code. Um, uh, within the code itself, including note the internal consistency of the algorithm. Um, but you can use these in very clever ways. You know, you can check, for example, you, you have in place a really clever algorithm um, that you use instead of a brute force algorithm, and you can make sure that its results, when you first roll it out, consistently match the results you would get through the brute force algorithm. It's just more efficient. At, at getting those results. And you can, in your assertion, confirm the two give the same results. Now, that may sound wild. Like, well, it, if, if you're running the brute force algorithm, why are you putting in place an efficient algorithm? Because the assertions are typically disabled for user code. So that assertion should be running only during the development process. And it's running the brute force algorithm and confirming that it gives the same results as the efficient algorithm. But then you turn assertions off. And that's the other thing about assertions. They can be turned off really, really easily by um, a number of mechanisms. In Java, you can turn them off, Java and Scala, you can turn them off on a per, 
per module basis, a per class basis, I think. You could say turn off all the assertions in this area of the code. And you can put in place mechanisms similar to what we have for logging that you can enable and disable certain sort of levels of assertions, et cetera. So in short, um, we can do comparisons of results of, of algorithms. You could check if the and something like C or C++ is the heat corrupt. Um, is a reference passed into a data structure, you know, not null. Um, uh, you can do refactoring of code and test that it gives the same results as, as the original code. Um, uh, if you're assuming that it's a certain relationship um, uh, in the code, you can confirm that it does hold, there's no duplicate entries, etc. So these are common uses. Um, and, um, you know, here, uh, you're typically going to want to log if assertions have failed, you want to put in place logging. I'd like to encourage all of you to put in place logging for your code, um, whether it's with log4j or Java 8's built-in logging mechanisms or logging uh, libraries for JavaScript or what have you. Logging is good. Logging is very powerful. Um, when it's combined with testing. Because uh, a logging framework done right is number one, scalable. You can scale up the amount of information it, it, it logs or scale down. And what that means is if you're trying to debug or trying to test something, you scale up the amount of logging. You have it log more detail on what it's doing. If you're not so interested in debugging this section of code or or debugging the code and you're just sort of do broad testing, say a smoke test, you're not gonna be logging in that level of detail. Um, and if you're running the code in production mode, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be doing much logging. But another aspect of logging besides scalability is we'd like to be able to use logging to output to different places. So good logging frameworks will allow you to declarative like in a config file, say, I want to log this program for the next run without recompiling the program. I want to log to text files, I want to log to a database, and I want to log to an HTTP post to this site. So when it finishes running, crashes, finishes successfully, it posts a log to this site. What I'd really like to see for many projects is moreover, if there's a crash, if there's an assertion that's failed, that you have a handling mechanism that actually reports back to the mothership what happened. So if you've got people you know, using your app on their smartphone and they encounter a crash, you know about it. And you have a, a stack trace. You have a, a log that, that describes what was going on when the crash occurred, prior to the crash occurring. Um, for those who have done Android development, you know ADB or similar tools can allow you to sort of do logging as a program runs. And it's good if you can get those logs given to you instead of having to go get them, or having to go recreate them, they get given to you. So think about that. I was gonna talk about peer reviews, but I think I'm going to jump forward because of the question about um, incremental delivery, about builds, um, I'm, I want to talk uh, forward uh, here about continuous integration. I will say that continuous integration um, is one of many incremental processes that we put into place to help ensure flexibility of a project and with respect to change needs and to help ensure that we spot issues as early as possible, whether it's misunderstandings of a user's requirements. You get the code in front of them as soon as possible, a UI, and if you don't understand the requirements, they notice it as soon as possible, rather than six months down the road. Again, you've gone over there, they wanted you over here, and they only discover it then. Um, but incremental, um, incremental deliverables, as far as sort of check-ins, are also following those lines of heading off risks. In terms of incremental delivery of the system, I would ask you, if, if you think about scheduling features for your system, one of the things you should be thinking about is priority to the user. 
What do they want next? What do they feel will deliver the most value? But that's not the only thing you should consider. What else might you consider besides what they say they want? What else might you consider? So they say, okay, I want feature ABC. Why don't you just always go do ABC? Might, <clears throat> might be impossible. Darn right. Why might it be impossible? <clears throat> um, they don't know the technology, so exactly. there's a barrier. Exactly, exactly. It may be that you actually can't do ABC without first doing D. You, you got to have, I mean, technically it doesn't make any sense to deliver ABC without first getting in place D. This is not infrequent. I mean, it took me a while to get through my head, but the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to talk about user-centric computing, delivering to the client what they want for each deliverable. And I believe in that very much, and that's great and delivering value to them. But the fact is that, let me tell you two awkward facts. Number one, users don't always know what they want. They have a hard time envisioning sometimes what's possible. And so it's, it's a dance. I mean, you've got to get them something concrete, which is kind of close to what they want, which is kind of related. And often that sharpens their thinking. Another ugly fact, it sharpens our thinking as software engineers. Because we don't really know what they need either. And seeing them react to what we give them helps us sharpen how we think about it. But it's more than that, ladies and gentlemen. Because often, getting something in front of them soon doesn't mean always just giving them what, what they say they want. They, they want to have a dialogue too. They want to. They want to know how, how much is this going to cost? How, much is, how long is it going to take? And they may say they want ABC. And you say, ABC can take a year. You know, how about we start with D? And then we'll give you A. How, could, how soon can you get that to me within a month? Oh, yeah. Yeah, OK. I don't know why you're doing D, but give me A, and, and we'll look at it. Often there's this dialogue back and forth because they don't know the cost of things. They don't know what's hard. They don't know what's easy. I mean, you know, that A, B, and C may be of wildly different level, degrees of, of complexity. And you don't just say, yeah, okay, sure, whatever you want. You say, well, you know, um, some of that's hard, some of it's not so hard. And you have this dialogue with them and you get them something and they say, oh, I don't, why would I need C? It's like, Oh, that's a much easier way of doing it. You know, you show them something. Because they're not thinking about what's possible with the, with the clarity that you guys sometimes bring. You ladies sometimes bring. I mean, it's, 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 it's something that really needs both sides to contribute. So don't, don't believe this idea that they're always going to just say, give me this next, and you always do that. No, there's a dialogue. There's a dialogue back. And one of the things you consider, besides what's hard, and one of the things you consider besides that A depends on B, and B depends on, or what have you, that what depends on what, which they're not going to know. One of the other things you consider is risk. You want to you wanna settle risks as soon as possible. If this technology is bad, if this technology is not going to work, you want to know about it as soon as possible. So what do you do? You build a spike prototype. You say, OK, look, we've never used this technology of you know, uh, Bootstrap. We've never used Google Real-Time API. I've never done something with material design. Um, uh, never used Istanbul for testing, coverage testing before, what have you. Um, let's, let's, we'll get someone on our team to try a little experiment with it. You, you try building a tiny throwaway project. Try putting it in place. So you have two technologies, right? We want to marry web VR with Google real time API. Mm. Um, so we'll put them together um, in a little spike prototype. It, it's throwaway code. It's just 
it, we're not going to use it, but we're going to test to make sure they play together nicely. Because sometimes technologies do not play together nicely. You try to use aspect-oriented programming with, uh, you know, with JUnit or something, and 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 maybe you, you know, they they don't they're not happy campers together. Um, so uh, so you you do a spike prototype. So in short, you want to do you want to be savvy to risk. You want to, if possible, you want to decrease risk over time. This is not gospel. I mean, this is this is stuff that. Um, it's nice if it leads to decrease in risk. You should have less uncertain, big uncertainty about certain technologies. Does Cassandra play nicely with, um, you know, with our um, uh, with our uh, Zeppelin or what have you? But you, um, you you try to decrease risk and your uncertainties around technology risks. And the customer is not going to know about this too. The the um, the end user is not going to know about the risks involved, and you have to have that mature discussion. Look, we're kind of worried. We think this technology would be great, but we're not sure, you know, how well it will work with iOS 11. Let's try this out. Um, and it requires some risk assessment and sort of assessing. Okay, what are people saying about this technology? Has anyone used it in our group? Did any previous team used it, etc.? Um, okay. So I do look for sort of risk and value delivering to the rules. You know, if what you're delivering makes sense from the standpoint of decreasing risk and increasing value. Um, let's suppose there's, let's suppose you're doing something with Oculus and you're not sure how Oculus is going to support a certain functionality that your project's gonna need later. And the client says, well, I don't need that to deliverable three, but you're not sure if Oculus is gonna work with it. And you'd want to look at a backup system if it did, you know, an alternative VR system. It behooves you to check as soon as possible because if you go halfway through, you're invested in Oculus, and then you can't deliver on this whole area of functionality, you're out. But if you head it off early, okay, now you're talking. Now you're talking. You can, you could go to an alternative technology that that um, uh, that doesn't have that encumbrance. Okay, let's talk about continuous integration and smoke test. Okay, um, continuous integration is a process whereby we, we trigger builds on a server, on some pipeline as it's commonly called in the GitLab context or Git context, when we perform a check. Okay? And it's viewed as kind of the heartbeat, the, the sync pulse of the project, or terms that were used for it in the past. I have to say, I stand before you proud for having been a develop, uh, member of the developer team that first pioneered the start of this technique in its form then, which was daily builds uh, before you folks were born. This is sort of, thir this is 30, about 30 years ago, okay? Um, yeah. Um, and uh, it was daily builds, and the team was the Microsoft Excel team. 12 person team, um, really gelled team, um, high morale, delivering the first few versions of Excel. It was awesome. And what we had in place then was a daily build. It wasn't, it wasn't continuous integration because machines weren't fast enough. Every night it would do a daily build and, uh, and produce a new version of the product. These days you do check-ins on Git and um, you do the build at that time. And really what's involved is typically one-step compilation linking. This is not someone compiling manually. This is, you have the pipeline set up on Git, GitHub, for example, or you have it set up in Apache Continuum, or you have it set up in Jenkins, or you have it set up on Hudson, or in Cruise Control, or whatever environment you want to work. There's tons of them out there. Because continuous integration is seen as an absolutely key technology. And when you check in, it does compilation linking, Commonly, it does testing of style or run a whole battery of tests, and it runs this thing called a smoke test. Now, a smoke test is not necessarily a monolithic single test. It may be a collection of unit tests and system tests that basically exercise the functions, the main functions of the app or of the web app or desktop app, whatever it is. Um, 
And the point is that it tests it for a sort of basic stability. If, it's, if it fails the smoke test, if these tests fail, let's, a classic test is, can you log in? So I had, um, a number of years ago, I was teaching this class. And we had a team that reported just amazing test results. So they gave me, I don't know, a dozen, a dozen to 15 tests, all of which were reporting running perfectly. So then I took a look at the test logs. I noticed that each test had a very similar log. It said basically, cannot log into system. Okay, so, so it wasn't even getting into the system. And then in the test report, it gave three thumbs up. It's like a big toe and two thumbs or something, right? Um, three thumbs up for each one, pass the test, pass the test, pass the test. I mean, that's, that's nonsense. And what you're looking for a smoke test is, is basically, is the system stable? Is are, are the basic tests running as far as logging into the system, as far as undertaking common tasks, are they still working? Because if those are not working, do you really want people to get this code, which has just been hosed the system? I mean, if the system was working before, and it's basic functionality, ability to log in, ability to undertake common tasks, if people are writing code that builds on that, and that tests other pieces of it, et cetera, and you leave it in place after it's broken that functionality, they do a, a poll. They do a poll of the latest results from Git or the SVN update or whatever it is. And if they get that broken system, they're gonna be in a bad way, right? They're not gonna be able to continue their testing because they can't even get to that portion of the system now. They can't even log in. So how are they gonna test it? How are they gonna continue to run tests on their portion when when it's hosed. So a smoke test tests if the system is hosed. Is the system able to run in a basic way? And I'm not saying you have to have one monolithic code base. What I'm saying is you often take several system tests and some unit tests and put them in there and you declare, okay, that's a smoke test. And over time that evolves, not in the sense that it necessarily, a lot of new test code needs to be written de novo, rather, your more system tests get written to test new features of the system that have been added, and you add them into the smoke test over time. And so the smoke test is kind of a, a collection often of tests that will, will test out some basic features in the system. Um, and if a build is host these, if it's host 60% of, of the functionality now fails after it all previously ran fine, because the smoke test should, in general, always pass. If now 60% of these have failed, you don't want people to get that built. You don't want people to get that latest update to the code base. You want to roll back, and you want to sort out what's gone wrong. What has happened here? So maintaining this smoke test requires time. I mean, um, someone's got to do the work. This is all automated, right? This is going to be occurring at 2 o'clock in the morning. The build master is asleep hopefully getting a well-deserved sleep. Um, and this is all running automatically, automagically, when you check into GitLab or GitHub or, or you check into Continuum or whatever. It's all running automatically. But, but over time, the smoke test needs to evolve. And so you need to add more system tests into that and say, run these tests. Run these 10 now. And then later, a few more features get added. Now run these 15 tests as part of the smoke test. And those are just the standard tests written by the build. Does that make sense? Okay, now, who does that? Who maintains that? Who sets up the pipeline on GitHub or GitLab or Apache Continuum or Jenkins or, or Cruise Control, whatever? That's the build master too. Who is putting into place the Maven scripts or the Gradle uh, code or putting it to place the, the basic mechanisms that perform the compilation. That's the build master. Who's configuring it so that the continuous integration pipeline doesn't merely stop there, but also um, goes and uh, integrates with the database, recreates the database from a schema, from scratch, populates the database. 
It uh, maybe runs inspections on the code that are automated in terms of style, and maybe it deploys. It pushes off to test servers if everything has worked. Who writes all that code or that me mechanism, configures it um, to, to do this? Who writes the SBT scripts? The build master. That's the build master. And those things are, are moving target. So over time, as the database gets changed, there may be aspects of what's needed to the database. As the test environment gets changed and you have to deploy to other virtual machines, this part may get changed. As you put in place a code checker, code style checks, this will need to get changed. And the compilation of the source code will need to get changed because there's more modules, et cetera. So this build script is going to build all of these different pieces. Okay? Um, you might want to check out Rex Black's book. There's a guy named Rex Black. He wrote a book. Uh, it's a black book, as it turns out, um, called Critical Testing Processes. And he lays this out pretty well. So, you know, with an ant build, you might have something like this. Um, uh, you know, you, you do a clean. You want to clean out the results of earlier builds so you're not, if something fails, um, you want to know about it. <laughs> you don't want to be reusing something that compiled fine before and not realize the newest version has failed. You want to do, say, an SVN update to get, to get the updates. You want to compile sources, test, and you want to integrate the new database, and you want to run the tests, run code inspections, and package and deploy the system to go out. This is what professionals do. I mean, they, they build, they create continuous integration pipelines that automate this process. We're computer scientists. We don't like doing things by hand. And you especially don't like doing things by hand at 2 a.m. in the morning every time someone's checked input. So you want this to all be on. And it is, it is a drug for if you can get this um, going. I mean, it, it really is a good thing. It lets you be confident things are working well if it builds. You're, you're, sure, you're confident you haven't screwed things up. Okay? Um, so why do we do this? Well, there's several reasons. We reduce integration headaches. Look, the fact, continuous integration, it's not just, it's not just the fact that you do a build automatically when you check things in. That's great. You do a build when you check things in. OK, great. All that, you don't need to do it manually by hand. You don't need to run the test by hand. That's all done. That's great. That's, that's all well and good. But that's not the heart of, of the issue. The heart of the issue is you're bringing together your code with other people's contributions. You're doing your check-in to the repo, and you've contributed just parcel changes, and the rest of the repo has been contributed by others and their latest contributions. And really what continuous integration is about is continuous integration, your code with other people's latest changes. And really, that's closer to the heart of the value offered because that is something which prevents you from going weeks assuming your code's going to play nicely with someone else's code, only to find two weeks later that your code doesn't play well with theirs because you've been working off an old version of their code, and now their newest code conflicts with yours. It doesn't play nicely together. What they've gone done, done those two weeks has been different from what you have, made different assumptions, and now they don't play together at all. Maybe you've duplicated work. Maybe you've made incompatible assumptions, both reasonable but incompatible about how things work, and your code doesn't play nicely together. And you've spent two weeks going in the wrong direction, and now suddenly you have to spend a long time coming together. In continuous integration, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, continuous integration allows you to avoid that. Why? Because you are continuously integrating with other people's latest code. You're checking yours into the repo, and the repo already contains their check -ins. So you have reduced likelihood of merge conflicts. After two weeks, you might have a lot of merge conflicts. Only a few things have changed on your side. And so if there is a problem, you have a better sense about where it is. And you more quickly identify problems of incompatibilities with their assumptions. Right? Um, running the smoke test frequently, you make sure that 
when your code is combined with theirs, you haven't hosted the system collectively, without being the fault of yours necessarily or theirs, you, you want to make sure you haven't screwed up the system, right? Um, and um, you typically have a product. You typically have something that results that you could show someone and test. Um, uh, and it reduces the need for someone to write status reports and so on. Generally, the build is reports on build success or failure are one of the most valuable feedbacks you can get about, about the uh, status of a project. If you see that the last 20 builds have all passed, the project's probably doing, it's probably pretty stable, pretty good. If I see half the last builds have failed, there's a problem here. People aren't checking in things enough, or they're not passing a discipline where before they check in, they get everyone else's code, the latest version of their code, and testing with that. By the way, BBT, um, Build Validation test, Testing Scripts, um, that's another reference to something that includes smoke testing, okay? Um, set of tests that, that have to run to, to basically test, um, test the system. And ladies and gentlemen, professional projects, you may have hundreds of these tests running for a given build. Um, I know one software package that went commercial that, that uh, is, is now the basis of a very successful company selling in four continents um, uh, came out of here. Uh, we had uh, 900 tests in place you know, for one of the versions uh, uh, that was in place here. And those tests would just be run. You know, time to make the donuts. Every time you check in, we run a bunch of tests. Um, it improves uh, customer morale, team morale. You see the latest version. And frankly, it fixes developers fix bugs before continuing developing, <coughs> which is a serious issue if you don't have some enforcement uh, mechanism for this. Um, so, yeah? Uh, one thing I was supposed to remind you about. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Announcement. Yeah. Oh, question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So my experience with like integration builds yeah. so far, yeah. I've had a lot of issues trying to de decouple the build with the particular database instance. Is it usually in, in the way <coughs> to use like a like a Docker instance to create the database first and then try to test against that as opposed to like say using a staging server or development server? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, use of technologies like Docker is on the cutting edge for this, and it's really quite uh, advised. It's taking the world by storm right now, containerization. Um, and uh, one of the things that Docker supports, as you'd appreciate, would be sort of a self-contained, um, internally consistent uh, uh, you know, completely defined sort of environment for um, for the database or, or other resources. And I think that's a cleaner way to do it, um, in my view. But I need to talk a little bit more about, about the specifics of the situation. Um, uh, suffice it to say that you generally want different resources in place for <coughs> test, for people who are testing with a database. You typically want different test databases and developers need their own databases so that it's not everyone in the team going to the same database. Um, because, you know, I run some code, it, it stomps on the database. You run some code, it stomps on the database. Maybe my code didn't work the first time, I want to recreate it and I want to rerun it and it, it doesn't fail in the same way. Why? Maybe because the database has changed because Change it. Um, so generally, you want a for testing purposes and for dev purposes. You generally want you know very well defined, completely reproducible uh, database contents and and a database configuration. And if you have multiple people hitting the database and changing it out from under you, it's hard to do as controlled a set of tests and validation um, as you'd like to do. So I think the idea of a dockerized container um, using, using sort of a very precisely <coughs> defined and recreated environment um, 
is uh, would be a, a valuable resource. But again, maybe you want to talk a little bit more in detail about about that. Um, yeah. So um, uh, time is just about up, but I do want to um, mention two big things. The first thing is career fair, good to go, and encourage that. Second thing is this weekend. Um, there is a hackathon associated with emerging agriculture, and there's actually a sign over at the career fair as well. It's another one just outside the main computer science office. Um, uh, this uh, hackathon is sponsored by, as I understand it, uh, Collabs, is that? Among, among others. Um, yeah. Among others. And it's taking place at Collabs, which is over, yeah. over in Innovation Place in the concourse building. Um, and um, you know, it's it's kind of a focused um, focused time that you could uh, work on some neat projects. Uh, they'll be recruiting people to work on projects, having project pitches, I imagine, probably tomorrow night, and uh, recruit people to work on them. And um, you know, by the end of the weekend, you may have some neat stuff in place. So think about uh, exploring that. Um, Eric here uh, knows a lot more about it, and so if you wanted to. Talk with them, you could do it, or you could also look at the information provided outside the computer science office or over at the career fair. Great opportunity. I encourage you to uh, to explore that as well as the career fair. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your attendance. And um, please try, if it possible, um, by this weekend to articulate who is in the various accountable positions in your project. And um, and what projects you're working if possible. If you need more time, I'm willing to consider it, but please let me know as soon as possible. Okay. Thanks.